Hello everyone. It is May 30th, 2023. It's Tuesday. It's Harp Tuesday. And today I'm going to talk to you and, and teach you, I suppose, that piece that I just played. So this is the very first piece in Betty Prey's second harp book. Um, and it's funny because I know the first harp book very well. I have I, obviously a well-worn copy. It's what I started with and I, I still use it today with students. But I don't really know the second harp book at all. And I, my teacher, I don't think, really used it. And I, the reason for that, I think, is because most of the pieces in here are, need a pedal harp, or are certainly written assuming a pedal harp. Because at the time, uh, Lieber harps were much less common. So some of them can be adapted here, but some of these are, of course, much easier on the pedal harp. But this first piece, for sure, is, is works on Lieber Harp, as you just saw. And it was actually a suggestion by a viewer. And I'm always looking for topics for Harp Tuesday uh, episodes, so let me know if you have any ideas. And I think this is a perfect Harp Tuesday episode because there's lots of little... It's short, it's just two pages, but there's lots of little things in here that are worth talking about. So let's dig in. Um, and first, just a kind of an overview of the piece, because I think that can be helpful sometimes. Uh, when you're first starting a piece, just to get a look at what's going on. So we have this little intro, the first line, six bars, this little intro with arpeggios. Then we get the melody. And so it's worth sometimes just playing that as a single note, this little bit here, starting on the, on the second line where, where the melody comes in. So, you know, what, what is that, right? What, what are we playing? Just G, F, G, A, A, B flat, B, A. Oh, and then what do we do? G, F, A, G, A, A, B flat, A. So those first four bars and the second four bars are basically the same. The first time and the second time, there's no repeated B. Then something new, I think. So we're starting, this is right here. So just G, A, B, A, A, G, F, E, go back to F, bit of a scale, all the scale stuff. And then G, A, F, G, A, A, F, D. And then we get the harmonics. And I'm gonna play them, I guess I'll play them up an octave. melody. Uh, that can be sometimes helpful just to kind of play through that and get that one in one's ear. Of course, listening to a performance is a fantastic way to get it in your ear as well. Um, we're in the key of F with our B flats down, or in fact, I would say we're in the key of D minor, which is the relative minor of, of F. Because we're starting with a D minor arpeggio, we ended with a D minor, we got a bunch of minor chords in here. And you'll notice I say set middle C to sharp. So the only time we play this middle C on Lieber harp, uh, well on either harp, but on Lieber harp the only time we play, because the only time we play middle C it's sharp, on Lieber harp we can set it. On the pedal harp we'll have to do some, some pedal changes. Um, because we have a C uh, somewhere I believe that, that is uh, natural. Or maybe we can set it. Um, I didn't actually check. Um, that's a good question. Are there any C's in here that are played that are natural? I think not. So actually you can set your C sharp on pedal harp as well, all your C's to sharp. And there's going to be one lever change. You saw that G sharp and G natural again. So let's start with the intro. So here we just get a nice arpeggio, a great, like one of this is one of the sort of easiest types of arpeggios where it's a three note chord, and so then it's gonna be the same shape, in this case a root D, same one, same one, and then this A octave. So we can find both hands to start with. We can look at where we're going with the left hand. I would be looking at this D right here. Same shape, we're gonna find a root position D chord. And once 
Once we've found the left hand, we can look, and I would again be looking for the bottom note this A and trusting that my hand will find an octave, so I don't need to actually look all the way up and find its higher A. I'll just find this sort of with my peripheral vision. With an arpeggio or something like that, one of the most important but easily sort of uh, not noticed aspects is where you're looking, right? To, to lead, have the eyes get there first before the hands, because it's hard to get the hands there until you have at least some visual reference. Then we get a G minor, so we start with a G second inversion. Still ending with an A octave, and then back to the original end. And we get a little fermata, this, this funny little symbol here, um, that means we can just take extra time. So there's our intro. Then we get the melody, and as I, as I said, the first four bars and the second four bars are basically the same melody. Now, later on, she does mark some chords as rolled, but I think you can feel free to experiment and see whether you would like to roll some of these chords. As a practice thing, it's great practice for some big four-note rolled chords in the right hand. If you are going to roll them, it will be from the bottom to the top, including the left hand, and the left hand octaves will be rolled. So, so we won't go or it's just six notes in a row or for the first one, five. thumb, so these, there's the beat, so we have to start that rolled chord early, uh, depending on how fast we're playing it, so that the beat falls on the thumb. Um, and I think when I just played it now, I didn't do the last one roll, so I maybe rolled. All of them could not be rolled. Uh, see what you like, see what sounds good to you, or use as an opportunity to practice some rolled chords. There's a little left hand pattern, G, F, E, F, a little sort of walking bass pattern. And then we change this G up, and now we're close to the soundboard. And I actually, I think last week's or last episode was talking about, you know, how high or low on the strings and talking about pre de la table, close to the soundboard. So here she tells you what that symbol means, right? And that uh, what it's called, close to pray to the table, close to the soundboard. And she actually specifically talks about how it um, it sounds best, uh, easiest to play with a second finger, right? We get sort of best sound with the fingers. Um, and that fact that because it's in the middle of this between the two staves that means it applies to both hands. So it's applying both to the right and the left hand. So the left hand is pretty easy. Just like the first four bars where we had this, where we're going, we play a note, we go down one, down one, and then back up. So it's starting on a different note, but the same kind of pattern. With the right hand, we might play around with fingering. So normally this chord, it's a fourth part, we would finger that with one and two. But because when we play close to the soundboard, we don't want to drop the thumb. We want to keep the thumb in a sort of normal position. It means it's impossible for the thumb sound to get quite as much of a close to the soundboard sound as the fingers. So we could conceivably play this chord with two and three or two and four. I think I probably played it with two and three. Here we could try and play this chord with 4-3-2, but just for ease of use, I just went 3-2-1-2-3. And here we could connect like this, which I'll talk about more in a moment, connecting into the bottom of the chord, but because it would be nice to maybe play this A with 2, uh, because that gets us closer to the soundboard, I connect to the top of the chord. 
switch the G back down. And now, aha, more more sort of technique stuff, we get open thumb or etouffe. And again, she tells us what that means, right? And it's, I've done a number of episodes, I'll link to one right up here, talking about this technique. And we see the first two bars, one, two, three, one, two, three, we're just going down this descending bass line, then up, down, skip, and end on a D again, we're in D minor, it's, we might expect to end on a D potentially. So some great practice for the open thumbs. You have a range of options with these, right? You can go. We can use the, the etouffee, the open thumb technique to get very staccato by placing the next one very rapidly. Remember, you don't go back and place this one that you've played. It's always the motion of placing the next one that creates the muffle. But I think to me, in this case, I, I'm not looking for a, a really staccato sound, but just more of a, maybe a detached sound of super staccato sound. Again, just because it is open thumb doesn't imply that it's staccato. So if as a, an arranger or a composer you wanted to be very clear that you want staccato, you would also want to put a staccato marking a dot over each of these notes and then it would be quite clear. Um, uh, at the same time, you could also put uh, legato or something like that for the left hand um, if you wanted to make it clear that yes, it's open thumb so it's not getting too buzzy or muddy, but you want to delay it as long as possible. Of course, it's maybe as legato as possible would be a better thing to put because it's not going to be, it's not going to be as flowing as just fingered uh, notes where we're not stopping the previous ones, but it is, again, there's a range of sounds available. And I want to talk about the right hand, how we're going to get into this chord here, because I think this bar and a, and a few notes is maybe one of the hardest bits. And here I'm going to suggest a slide. So, and we'll also place the bottom of this chord. So we'll place A, C sharp, and thumb on the A, and slide. So we'll kind of lock that thumb into place and we'll just push it onto the G. We won't worry about playing the A, we just push the thumb onto the G. And then we're ready to play that chord. So this little sequence then. If we have this, then even though this is a bit of a strange or less common chord shape, right? It's a seventh between the top and the bottom note, top and bottom note. And the left hand's had to go up now. It was going down, it goes up. But by do that slide, we're ready to go. And then this next bit, we get again some, some nice little sort of, I guess, teaching material because you can see with this bracket, and maybe I'll talk about this one because it's easier to see. It's not across the bar, or, uh, the, the, um, it's not from one line to the next. Um, but you can see the bracket underneath. And what that means is, so remember when we encounter a bracket, it's very specific. It means before you play the first note, that's under, or in this case above, this, this new bracket, you must place all the notes, or at least as many as you possibly can, that are included in this bracket. So here we have this F, okay, we place the thumb on that, but then we have this chord as a bracket, so how are we going to place this? Well, we know we're going to play this chord with 4, 3, 2, 1 because it's the only way we can play it, right? Four notes, we have to play 4, 3, 2, 1. So we can't place the G because the thumb's already busy. <laughs> Yeah, the thumb, thumb's busy, but we can place four, three, two. We can place the bottom three notes. So that uh, this, two, three, four, that D, B, G are placed. We play the thumb. Oh, and now all we have to do to find this chord is move the thumb up to the G. The alternative, right, is to connect to the bottom, uh, connect to the top of the chord and reach for the bottom to play two and then reach 
four three two instead of being pre-placed, they can reach down. So I would say the in a lot of the times we will connect to the top of the upcoming chord so that we get the melody line being connected rather than but when you get to four note chords it can become more and more enticing and more and more helpful to connect to the bottom to place the bottom of the chord and play the thumb twice because there's so much to find so if it were say well i mean we could do something like this but you know earlier on when i was talking about being close to the soundboard with this we're just reaching down for two fingers but here to reach down for three is that much more work to do and so while going to one uh, retains this smoothness of a connected two notes in a row rather than thumb thumb yeah i think it's, it can be very helpful connect to connect to the bottom in a case like this so if i go back to the end of this line with this g I find the bottom three notes of this D chord, the A, D, F, is these three right here. And I play that G, move the thumb up to the A, find all of this, looks like a G7. And here, on this next bit, uh, I ignored the two, and I placed a thumb here and connected this, and I actually went one, two, three, four. I'll talk about that one in a moment as well. So on this big chord here, rather than I went ahead and found the chord and then just played the thumb twice. And a chance to play that low A octave if you happen to have it on your lever harp, it would sound fine just to leave it out, right? Um, so it's fine to just leave that out if you don't have it. And then I went like this placed, it's a first inversion four note D chord, play the thumb and then play the chord with two, three, four. That requires a certain amount of uh, finger control and independence. And so I certainly think playing or even playing one, three, two, one would be absolutely acceptable. It's also, it's quite slow, but if you can, this is a, like a very smooth way of doing it. and. Also, it could be a way to practice that ability, like to see, is it possible to play two, three, four with a somewhat stretched out shape and have them all happen at the same time in volume level. And then, oh, more stuff, we got some harmonics. So again, a link to a video on harmonics, but we've got left hand playing these harmonics, this little melody. And it can be tricky when we've got a melody in the left hand and a right hand accompaniment above it, our ear is drawn to the higher note. And so it can be hard to hear. And, you know, she's marked these as pianissimo and these as piano to try and help us hear that as the melody. But it also is hard to play like one hand softer than the other. And in particular, I think, to play the right hand softer than the left hand. So really listening, you know, have the right hand soft, and the left hand loud during practice and listen for that left hand. Also record yourself because it might be as you're playing, you're having a hard time hearing the left hand, but then when you record yourself, maybe you say, oh yeah, the left hand melody is coming through underneath there. So this next bit is quite challenging for the right hand because we're playing this D chord, root position, three note D chord, D minor, and then we're jumping up an octave. And the problem is, where are we looking? So maybe we're looking at the music. We want to look at the left hand, especially with harmonics. It's, it's can be very important to look to sort of make sure you're going to get the right height, because if you don't, <laughs> it's not going to be so good. And yet, do we have to look up and find this as well? So for me, I can see this note in my peripheral vision without having to strain too much and change my um, neck or head position, but I can't really see this. I would have to like distort myself a little bit to see that. 
and at the same time, I'm also wanting to look down here. So this is a chance to practice. Can you jump up an octave and find that D chord? So you should be able to find a root position chord, right? That shouldn't be a problem. And we have this reference point here of this one we're starting on. So once we've found that, maybe, oh, I think I was one too short. Yeah. Maybe we can find that octave. Remembering to shift the elbow back and up and move the arm back. So we're not going like this, right? As we go up, we're going like this. So we maintain that same sort of hand position and arm position, but progressively, of course, getting higher with the arm because we're higher up, right, than we were down here. Um, trying to, and it feels, or it can feel very scary, right? Because there's nothing there to tell you whether you found it or not. Um, but some great practice for that and, and to see if you could potentially do that because then, you know, you can maybe find this out of your peripheral vision. Your notes, bom, po, to, ti, to. Ah, I was a little bit uh, too short, right? I got the C instead. Oh, can we jump and find this one as well? So, first inversion G chord. Can we find that octave? Nope. So, both practice for harmonics and for that right hand jumping and hopefully finding the right um, chord. And then finally, at the end, we have a glissando. So she has on the pedal harp an E sharp, which will double the F, so the sound of the glissando, right, will be. And the D that I don't have, because we're ending 8VA, there's a, which means an octave higher, right? So the written uh, D, of course, is this D but the 8 VA means it's an octave higher. So what can we do on the lever harp? So it, it, when I played it, I started an octave lower so I would get a two octave gliss and I just, I just ignored the fact that the E is natural and so the scale instead of hearing, instead of missing those E's, I just, I just glissed on them. Um, and, and she mentions, you know, specifically it's to be uh, soft, but right and slow, so and slow gliss glisses are actually often faster, uh, harder than a fast gliss because we want we don't don't want to get stuck or have one note be louder or softer than the other. So yeah, the control of the gliss. So that's one option. Um, you could also use the left hand to stop the E's so that they disappear. You can't do this too slowly because we really hear, hear that missing beat, but versus Or you could try and do it as a scale. So for example, you could just do or skipping the E's. You could also just do, let's see, end with sort of like the beginning. But I think certainly for practice, it's, it's nice to do the gliss. So I guess my suggestion would be what I did of the... Because it allows you to do just sort of a normal gliss and work on the control of that. If you like the sound of this, then go for it. It's just it has to be maybe a little bit faster than it's possible with a, with a sort of normal gliss. Um, and of course the piece is quite short, so I think it lends itself to, to repeating certain sections uh, and 
Uh, the intro could be fleshed out more. You could certainly fill in some of the chords or do, like, I think there's lots of scope to expand on this. It, Deep in the Forest, French Canadian tune, I, I couldn't find out anything about it. So if it's French Canadian, hey, that's great. Um, if, if you know anything about this tune, so maybe the title is in French, and again, that didn't help me when I was searching for it. Um, but if you know anything about it, post in the comments. And uh, yeah, so what a, what a nice piece. And lots of interesting things to think about and to work on in it, as well as it being, I think, a musically a satisfying piece to play. So I hope you've enjoyed that, and I will see you in two weeks for another episode of Harp Tuesday.